Hey everyone, uh, thanks for watching. I got a really exciting uh, video for you today. Uh, I have Bo Kim with me today, who's a subscriber, and he asked uh, a bunch of great questions uh, like I, uh, that I normally answer in my uh, subscriber uh, questions um, you know, uh, videos. However, he had so many, and I think they were all tied together, it would be a shame to break them up. So I said, you know what, Bo, let's, let's get out of an interview, and let's just go through the questions. And he said yes. So. Here we are today, and uh, Bo, uh, thank you for uh, thank you for your questions and being a subscriber. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Excited Excellent. to be here. This should be fun. So, why don't you go ahead and sort of tell you a little bit about your story, right? You sort of set it up in the video, but let's set it up or set it up in the you set it up in the Facebook questions, but set it up on the video. You started where you are now, uh, all of that, and then we'll get into individual questions. Yeah, sure. So, I'm a real estate investor based out of Los Angeles. And uh, I've been doing this for a little over a year now. I started um, last Thanksgiving uh, when I picked up the book Rich Dad Poor Dad and kind of got my brain working and f trying to figure out how I can create cash flow and assets and things like that. So um, soon after that, you know, I was looking around in my market and nothing really cash flowed. So I, I kind of went on the Bigger Pockets forum, started asking questions, going to local meetups, and then I found different Midwest markets, um, some that I knew of, some I had no idea where it was on a map, uh, but I quickly got myself acclimated and then uh, flew out over there and started picking up rental properties. Okay, very cool. So um, that's great. Uh, you did the right thing. So, again, I had the same thought, you know, 15 or 16 years ago, I tried to invest in the Bay Area. It just doesn't make sense for cash flow. So um, I found a different market. Mine happened to be driving distance. So, you know, two and a half hours away. Uh, but the Midwest, uh, you know, it does have some interesting locations. So uh, you, you have, I think you said 11 units now. Is that right? Yeah. So I have eight properties, a um, couple uh, single families and duplexes sprinkled around uh, mm -hmm. Kansas City, Indianapolis and uh, Little Rock. Okay. Uh, and then I also own two duplexes with a partner of mine. So, um, but that's 50-50. Sure. All right. So let's, uh, let's get into the questions because I like them and um, we'll just dive in. Go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, I was, I was reading your ebook and I was kind of uh, watching some of the videos that you put up that, um, on YouTube. And I noticed that, you know, you kind of divided your real estate um, experience into four phases. Yeah. And I think phase three was kind of talking about once the crash happened and you said everything was different, right? Yeah. And <laughs> um, a lot of these meetups I go to and when I listen to podcasts and things like that, you know, they talk about you know, now more than even a couple of years ago, a recession is coming and, you know, bracing yourself. How do you prepare yourself? So, you know, I, you know, have only been in this game for a little over a year. So I kind of look to ask uh, people who are a bit more experienced about, hey, not necessarily, you know, eight ball question where we're at, but if we think that it's coming in one or two years, what is like a thought process when you're still looking to grow and scale? Because yeah. I'm not looking to necessarily pause, but I definitely find myself um, being more strict with my numbers and okay. sticking to my guns and my criteria, yep. not trying to fudge them uh, just mm -hmm. to take down a deal. Yeah. But uh, yeah, what are your initial thoughts on that phase three? Yeah. So yeah, going through a downturn, really that, that rollover, uh, I think in one of your, your questions or you alluded to Warren Buffett's quote about, you know, when the tide rises, everybody looks good, but when it goes out, you find out who's swimming naked. I, I thought that was really wise words. Yeah. And then, um, you know, for someone to have your experience to be asking this question is, is, is outstanding. I've said repeatedly that I think if you've only invested for the last five years, you know, you're, you're in trouble, right? At least potentially not so much yeah. buy and hold, but certainly flippers. Flippers are in big trouble because a changing market will change everything and they won't see it coming. And pretty soon they have too much inventory with too expensive a debt and, and they go bankrupt. So, so I, these, I'll just call them 11 units. Um, these are buy and hold for you, right? They're not flips. Yeah. Okay. Long term. Yeah. So what I would do you know, what I did. So what, what I'm about to share with you is what I've done the last six months or so. So it's not theory. It's what I'm doing. Uh, I evaluated my portfolio. Uh, mm -hmm. I looked at anything in, you know, the bottom 10% of my portfolio. Right. And I said, you know, in any of these, um, 
you know, I don't want, cause we're, we're at the tail end of a, a seller's market for, you know, best case if, if not over. Uh, but I did sell and I'm not, you, as you've seen, if you read the book, I don't sell. Right. But there was a particular duplex in an area of town um, that has just gotten, went from bad to worse. Right. It was great 15 years ago, but for whatever reason, that little corner of, of, of my markets went to trash. So I sold it. Uh, I still made a bunch of money, right? Because I bought it during the crash. Uh, but I didn't want to keep that long term because it, it, you know, it's been negative for like three years in a row, even though I almost have no mortgage. So, uh, you know, what, what I would do is evaluate your property, see if there's any one that you're carrying. Um, particularly uh, because either because the debt's too expensive or turnover's too high or any of those reasons. And I would look to clean up any losers right now. That's the first thing I would do. And I don't necessarily mean for a guy like you who's looking to grow, sell. Maybe you 1031, right? Maybe you do what I did in, in, at the end of phase two, right? Where we 1031 exchanged a bunch of properties. Um, that's what I would, that's number one. That's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is I'd evaluate my debt. Um, you mentioned you had some hard money and private money and those things. Those often come with very short term windows or clocks, you know, one, sometimes six months, sometimes one, two, three years, not to mention expensive. Um, I would, I would be focused on trying to get better 30 year money. Even, even if it's, you know, it doesn't have to be these silly bank rates, you know, five and a half percent. My wife and I are currently, again, these are things we're doing. We're doing, um, We've done three. We're doing six more. So a total of nine refis with something, I think it's called cash call. Uh, they're giving us mortgage rates of six and a half percent. But it's better than the nine and 10 we had on our, our private and hard money loans. So, you know, those are the first two things that jump out at me is evaluate your 11. If there's one or a city or something that just is not performing like it should, dump it uh, in, your, in your place, exchange it, right? Take that equity, put it back in another market that you have. Uh, and then look at your debt structure. Because one of the things that happens in a change is debt becomes almost impossible. You still have this year, maybe 18 months, where debt's relatively easy to get for solid assets. So I take advantage of it. Don't get caught with hard and private money in a, in a downturn. That, that money gets, you know, scared money don't make money. So private money, hard money gets scared. Okay. Make sense? Yep. Um, speaking of 1031, I know, um, you kind of, uh, swapped out that, uh, was it the Fresno property? Yeah, we, we uh, stayed, yeah, we, like ten unit. yeah, we took a house and bought a, yeah, we flipped out a house and went into a 10 unit building. Yep. Yeah. And I think you mentioned in your book where you feel like based on your experience, the single family market and the multifamily market slightly has a different timeline. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of looking around, you know, right now, and I feel like, you know, a lot of these multifamily gurus Mm -hmm. are having pitching these multifamily boot camps and everybody and their aunt and uncle are investing in these syndications, right? So you have a lot of money in the streets. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think, although I would love to scale to like a smaller multifamily, not, you know, $1 million and above, Mm -hmm. um, you know maybe like a 20 unit or like a 30 unit or even yeah. a 12 unit. Yep. Um, what's your uh, thought on like what inning are we in on the multifamily versus a single family in your thought? Yeah. If you had to guess. Um, so first off, you know, I think we, we see the world scarily uh, similar. Uh, I too, and, and didn't want to call it out in the book, but I do in a couple of videos that these gurus doing syndications and apartments, they're pushing those, those assets to, ridiculously low cap rates because there's an inversion, right? Prices go up as cap rates go down. Um, and I wouldn't touch a multifamily over 30 units today unless for some reason it was off market. It was just, you know, once in a lifetime deal. Uh, anything on the market, LoopNet in your local MLS and, and anything. I get phone calls almost every day from agents in my markets because I know I own a bunch of stuff and all the stuff they're giving me is 20% overpriced. So I wouldn't touch that stuff with a 10 foot pole. That said, you know, commercial in real estate for apartments starts at five. Now, I would go look for five to 10 unit buildings because, again, that's a niche that's too small for syndication, right? So I like to fish where there's no competition. I'd avoid everything above 20. And frankly, in most markets like LA and in the Bay Area, I'd avoid everything over 10, right? Because the numbers just get crazy. Um, I might look there. Uh, but as far as your question, I think apartments are overvalued, right? So if we used a nine inning game, 
we're in the ninth inning, if not into extra innings. I think, I think what's going to happen is um, the other thing that people don't know about apartments is they come with different financing, right? You don't get 30 year fixed apartment loans, right? At least traditionally. Um, so they have, you know, five, six, seven year, you know, um, balloons or resets. And as interest rates have gone up, there have been deals that were done in the last three or four years that look good. But when the, when the interest rate resets, they're not going to look so good. Um, so there's going to be some assets coming online probably two to four years down the line at, at prices that make sense. And, you know, then we'll start to cycle all over again. Uh, but I think apartments are pretty high. I think um, single family homes, right? If you go above the median, like I talk about all the time, um, you know, we're in the, you know, we're in the seventh or eighth inning. So definitely behind apartments, but it's, it's still good and pretty late. Uh, affordable homes. So you take the median and below. I don't know what the median is in Indianapolis, but the rule kind of applies. If you stay at 75% of the median for that market, you know, you're, we're in the first or second inning, right? Maybe it's the third inning. It's just because there's, they're not making any more. All the new construction's too high. Uh, tariffs are making things more expensive. You know, all these, all these reasons. And if we go into a downturn, people stop buying, but they keep renting. Uh, so being a landlord with a bunch of properties below the uh, median in your markets is the safest place to be in a, a recession. Mm. And um, going back to your earlier question about kind of pruning your portfolio, mm -hmm. like the bottom 10% losers, do you have like a metric in terms of like a combined loan to value that, you know, you don't want to be this over leveraged? Do you have like a number? Well, f first off, I treat each individual property as their own entity. I don't, I don't mix anything. So, right. I look at each house, uh, a standalone. I don't go, Hey, it's just peanut buttered and that one sucks, but that one's good. Right. I treat them all individually. Yeah. Um, and I don't really look at LTV. Um, I, I look at cash flow. right? I want the yield or the cash flow on that building to be positive and, and likely, you know, north of five or 6% every year. And you know, when it's not, you know, like there's, there could be a great reason for it. Like maybe a person that had been there for 10 years moved out this year. Okay. Well, I'm going to give that property a break this year, but you know, that property I sold was bad for three years and had six or seven turns and the rents were going down and it's like, all right, uncle, I give up. Even though, even though I had zero debt, the building still wouldn't cash flow. So, you know, that's just, that just has to go, uh, you know, in theory though, cause you've seen everything I talk about is very conservative. I personally, you know, never go over 60%. Um, you know, nobody I talk to, I recommend going over 70. Uh, but when I started in fairness, you know, when I started all those years ago, I went as high as 90, right? So I don't want to be a hypocrite and not, you know, not forget where I started. Um, yeah, there were lots of deals I did in the beginning that I did 90%. I didn't know any better. Uh, I hadn't been for a downturn yet. Right. So, uh, but again, you know, LTV is really not that important. You could be 110% LTV if the building still cash flows or the house still cash flows, because you could hold it. That's what, that's what, that's the misnomer about LTV. It's the cash flow that allows you to hold it forever. Right. And that's what allowed us to survive the downturn and, and frankly thrive in the downturn was because all our stuff cash flow and frankly even got better because rents went up and occupancy went up. Um, so it really didn't matter. Sure. Our LTVs, you know, maybe they started the downturn at 60 and went to, you know, some of the stuff was worth less than what we owed frankly. So it was like 120%. But again, we weren't sellers, so it didn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm in the same boat where, you know, I'm just starting out. I'm hungry. Yeah. I'm hustling and uh, I'm, I'm keeping a monitoring eye on my LTV. But sometimes, like you mentioned, I'm using private funds and I have two deals going on at the same time yeah. and I'm waiting for the six month to season so I can cash back out. Yeah. But, you know, I'm looking at the market and I'm looking at my debt levels and you know, I'm trying to figure out what's a good balance so that, you know, I'm not swimming naked like that, that yeah. quote you said earlier. Yeah. So, okay. I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. So I think, you know, you're doing the right things. Um, you know, I, I would say doing two deals today, right. With a six month window is probably pretty safe. Uh, would I do that next December? You know, probably not. Cause if we're not in a recession by next December, it's around the corner. Uh, and I might ratchet that back to one. I would never tell you to stop, right? We bought through everything and um, you can always find a deal. Um, but to your point, you need to take your numbers and be more conservative, right? So I think yeah. I did a post on this or whatever where somebody asked me, what am I doing different? Well, the prices I offer are five to 10% lower. Uh, my holding times are, you know, four months longer on a flip or, you know, you just, you just have, to, it's not the same world, right? The last five years were fake or different than the next five years. 
So if you run your business the same way the last fi- this next five years, you did the last five years, you're going to be bankrupt. Uh, it's that simple. Okay. Um, this is a more of a personal question for my sure. not specific to real estate, but now that you know, you've left your W2 job and you're retired and focusing on real estate, um, is there a portion when you're looking at your net worth where you allocate back into paper assets? Um, you know, a lot of people that I talk to, some just hold strictly rental real estate. Other people may have a 60-40 split. Mm-hmm. I personally am keeping my 401k while I have my W-2 job because, I mean, it's not that huge, but it's actually the perfect amount to serve as the Fannie Mae reserves requirement. Ah. And sometimes I can take loans off of it. Yeah. So uh, I'm keeping it there, but obviously I'm nervous because it's constantly going down every day. But yeah. Um, I'm not touching it. So yeah, I'm intending to keep it, but I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Yeah. So there's a couple of questions. Um, and again, you asked for my experience, so I'm happy to answer that question. Sometimes I have to stay away from recommendations, right? Cause then people come after you and you recommended <laughs> this or that, and it was horrible advice. So yeah. nothing I am about to say is a recommendation It's simply a statement of fact of what I have done. Mm-hmm. So with that statement, um, when I had a W2 job, uh, I contributed to my 401k up to the company match. Right. So whatever my company matched, if it was dollar for dollar for the full 15 grand, I matched it. Uh, if it was dollar for dollar up to five grand, I, I matched five grand. And then what I did is every year I took a loan against it. Um, and then I paid myself back in a year, right? Because you can select the amount and then you can select how fast you want to pay it back. So I used my 401k every year to buy a property. Um, for probably 12 of my 15 years, I used my 401k to buy a property, which was awesome. Uh, because it was the down payment. Uh, so that's the first thing I did. And then the other thing I've done is that when I've left jobs, uh, instead of rolling them over to an IRA or self director or anything like that, which I probably should have done, I didn't do that. I just took the check. I paid the, paid the expense and put those assets, you know, that nice chunk of chat cash into real estate. Um, I am not a fan of paper assets. Uh, I think I'll probably do a video on this tomorrow morning, another rant. But I think, I think being invested in, in, in stocks is, risky. And again, my experience, right? 12, 13, whatever years ago it was, I had a bunch of money in Enron. Uh, you're probably too young to know what Enron was. It was basically a huge electrical you know, company that was the next generation. It, it skyrocketed and then it collapsed when it was figured out they were a bunch of liars, frankly. And then I remembered what I did is I took the money I had left over and I said, what's the safest thing I could buy? And I'm like, well, telephones, at and not going anywhere. So then I looked at the tele- telephone market and the best grower was WorldCom. Again, you're probably too young to know who that is, but let's just say that didn't end well either. And at that point, I'm like, I'm out. And we just had another example of this on Friday, right? With stocks, you have, you have market risk, you have sector risk, and then you have company risk. Think about those poor people that had J&J, right? Johnson & Johnson has been around for, I don't know, 100 some odd years. And now, again, I haven't done any digging, but I read the headlines and the headline says, asbestos in baby powder. You know, I'm like, oh, come on, right? Really? And then whack, their stock's 10%. So do I, am I in paper assets? No flipping way. I have no freaking control over that. I have no expertise. I have no inside track. Uh, I think it's the largest legal gambling thing. And eventually the house wins. You could be up millions of dollars uh, and then the house wins. And then J&J comes out and says, whoops, sorry, I didn't know I had asbestos and baby powder. And, you know, pretty soon it's gone. And yeah, n- none of that's for me. I don't, it's even when I've had a little bit of money in, it's just does, I don't sleep well. So I'm like, take it out. I'm done. Real estate lets me sleep better. <laughs> I, I smiled a little when you uh, mentioned Enron because um, I work as an auditor for a CPE firm during the mm. day. And part of my time is doing uh, Sarbanes-Oxley testing and compliance mm-hmm. for my clients. So yeah, Sox yeah. was, we could, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I go. smiled a little. <laughs> yeah, that was painful for me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, not to. No, it's fine. It's a good. Exp- I mean, but that's the answer, right? I do not. I I have zero okay. dollars, uh, and I have a decent net worth in the stock market. I the only other assets I have other than cash, um, mm-hmm. I do have some silver and gold, uh, mm-hmm. but not meaningful. If it's it's if it's a tenth of a percent, I I have it more just to you know, just because, frankly. Okay, and. Um, I think I also remember in your book, you mentioned, hey, you were kind of contemplating, should I tell up, sell off my 10 unit or 20 unit mm-hmm. to pay off some of my debt? Yep. So I was curious, 
Um, some people might say holding a multifamily is better because you got one bill, one loan, all yep. this, you know, and it's more scalable. But I wanted to get your thoughts. Are you doing it because you think um, you have a hot multifamily market that you can uh, sell it at a overprice? Um, or what's your reasoning behind wanting to sell that? To great pay question. Off the, yeah. Yeah, great question. Again, uh, there's sort of two parts to the answer. The first one is, uh, as I shared earlier in your innings discussion, mm -hmm. I thought the apartment market was hot. Right. I, I don't know if it was at the, you know, it was, if, I didn't know if it was peaking, but I knew it was at levels that I wouldn't buy. Mm. Right. So that was enough for me to go, you know what, if I'm not going to buy, would I consider selling? Right. So that was, that was the first sort of thought because I think you can always be pruning and managing your portfolio. And then the other answer, the other thing nagging me was, you know, for some reason, do I want to be debt free? Right. There's that whole live debt free, be debt free, you know, community out there that the, you know, Dave Ramsey and all of that stuff that goes on. Yeah. Um, and I just didn't know what I wanted, right? I certainly could pay it off and be done. Uh, mm -hmm. I have since decided not to because the apartment building cash flows <clears throat> and rents are going up. Uh, so I think I can do things to manage that building uh, to produce even more cash flow. So I've decided to keep it. That said, I am refining some debt, which I indicated earlier when I shared what I am doing and recommended for you. And I'll take the proceeds from that. So I'm going up to 60% LTV from probably 30% up to 60 because again, the market's just gone up. Uh, and I'm taking a big pile and then I'm paying off, I don't know, I think 10 to 12 homes. So I'll have a free and clear pile just, just in case the world comes apart again that nobody can take from me. Uh, and then I'll have my other assets levered to about 60%, right? If, if, you know, the world comes to the end, I can always live on that smaller pile. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. What's your thought process on choosing which ones to pay off and which ones to keep debt on them? Is there a difference? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. So what I did is I looked for the ones, I didn't want to do a lot of um, uh, refis because again, they're expensive, right? They cost a bunch of fees and all of that. So what I did is I actually refied all the multifamily. So I refied all the duplexes and triplexes. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I had any quads this time. No, so all duplexes and triplexes and I'm paying off all the houses. Okay. That was, that was the reason. Okay. Are these refis like a commercial loan or a portfolio loan? Nope. Individual loans. Cash call allows me to treat them. They, they portfolio loans themselves. So uh, at least that's what they've told me. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're doing all of them. It's a relatively quick process. It's about three weeks. It's more expensive than a bank, right? I think if I went to a bank with my credit score and net worth, I probably can get somewhere in the high fives, but it's frankly a hassle for me. I've done it before. They want a financial statement and assets and uh, you know, all my leases and it's just not worth it. It's such a freaking headache. Uh, but they've been very easy to deal with. We filled out one financial form in detail. They're just basically photocopying it. Uh, they're going out and doing legit appraisals. And, um, you know, they closed the first two in like 12 days or something. So I'm like, all right, that wasn't too bad. Sure, I'm paying an extra percent, but it doesn't matter in LTV of 60%. So it, it's all good. Oh, wow. So they didn't ask for, you know, your hair sample and a blood vial or anything nope. like that. <laughs> nope. No, it was, it, but all the other banks have. And I mean, it, it yeah. got so bad. We've, we've tried this before because I, I tried, we tried to refi last year, a couple of loans and um, they crushed us for like 30 days wanting yeah. something new. And fine. And then when they came back and asked for a copy of all 175 leases, I'm like, forget it, man. We're, we're done. You're just, you just lied to me. You told me this would be easy and it's clearly not. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so far so good. So we did two. Now we're going to go do six more. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I mean, I'm, you know, at eight right now. So I have two more of those golden uh, Fannie Mae tickets left. Yes. And after that, I'm, I'm trying to think, okay, how can I, being out of state, it poses a little bit of a challenge because I do uh, call some of the local banks in Kansas city and Indy and mm -hmm. because they were burned by the investors in 08, where, you know, when things went south, some of them just walked away. Yeah. These, some of these local banks don't want to work with out-of-state investors, right? Sure. Even though with a debt coverage ratio of 1.6 or it's cash flowing nicely, but it's hard to, you know, yeah. get these guys to call me back. So I'm wondering if you have any tips for out-of-state investors or, you know, even local banks who might lend for out-of-state properties. What's a good way to start, you know, breaking the ice and building a relationship? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things. So first off, kudos to you for calling local banks. Uh, most, most folks don't think to go that far. Um, keep, keep doing that because it just needs to be repetitive. I think there's a couple of questions I would ask if you're not already asking. One question I would ask is, you know, after you have, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, here are my addresses, net worth, blah, blah, blah. And they say no. 
ask them, do you know of any, any other community banks in your market that might lend to me? Right. Cause one, there's like real estate investors, um, local communities talk, and maybe there is a bank that's doing them that you just haven't found. So I would make sure to ask that one question for sure. Is there, do you know of any local bank that would be in, interested in investing in those? Cause I know you said no, but maybe somebody else will say yes. So that's yep. something I would do. Um, the other thing I would never forget to do is at least go to the bigger banks, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, or whatnot that are national and ask them, right? Because one thing is going to happen with all these banks and it's the market's changing for them. Refis have stopped. They're going to have to generate income different ways. In some ways is going to be doing more loans, right? N more net new loans. And that means investors because I think owner occupants are buying is coming down. So I would, um, I would call them and again, just, you know, same talk track. Hey, I'm buying in Indianapolis. I have these kind of assets. I'm looking to buy more. Um, you know, I'm willing to put this much down, you know, you, you want to play, right? Can we play or not? And same yeah. question, right? I know you don't want to, but you know, do you know anybody that might? So I think those are a couple of things to do. Um, yeah, that's what I'd be doing. Cause again, the market's going to change, right? The market, the, the lending market six months from now is going to be different than it is today. Cause interest rates will be higher. Refis will be even less. And banks are going to be hungry because if they don't get loans, they're going to lay people off. Right. Um, so yeah, it's coming. I think you just keep, keep making the phone calls. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know I'm firing a ton of questions at you. Keep so going. let me know if you have any questions. But no, you're doing great. Yeah. Um, I actually went to a luncheon recently where um, Bruce Norris of the TNG group was speaking. Love him. And yeah, um, he was actually speaking about the affordability index, and I know you like that metric. So I was, I still am not exactly sure how I'm supposed to use that metric. So can you elaborate just a little bit yeah. on how you use it yourself? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it is, it is a, it's my, um, you, hear, you know the saying canary in a coal mine, right? The coal miners used to go down when they brought a canary with them, but mm -hmm. when, when the canary unfortunately passed away or stopped singing, they mm -hmm. all left the mine, right? Because the canary would die first right? Small uh -huh. lungs. So I use it like I use the affordability as a warning sign. So this is how I use it for my market. Look it up for yours. I invest in Fresno. I think that should be clear to everybody for by now. Um, when I started investing in Fresno, the affordability index is that was about 43 or 44, as I recall. As we went up to 2008, unbeknownst to me, because I had not met Bruce Norris yet, I've only done the research after the affordability index went all the way down to 12 or 13. And um, again, I've already shared, we 1031 out at that time. We got lucky, right? We didn't know. We didn't know about the canary or the affordability index saying, get out, stupid. Um, <laughs> and then the market rolled over and then the affordability index went over 60, right? While we were buying all these things. So now the market's returned. So now people ask me, well, so where is it? So the market, the affordability index in uh, Fresno, I think is in the high 30s now. So still relatively healthy. But here's my warnings. If it ever gets to 20, I get nervous, right? I start paying attention. If it ever got to 15, there's a very good chance I would sell everything, mm. right? Because basically what it has said historically is it gets to 15, it keeps getting lower until it's stupid, and then there's a big crash. Uh, I hope we never see that again, or at least not for decades. But if we ever did, I would seriously consider selling at 15. Okay. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's pretty much all of my questions, but, um, you know, I, if there's anything that you feel like that maybe I can share, I'm one year in, but I've uh, been, you know, hustling really hard. So, yeah. So why don't we, why don't we talk yeah. about your markets? Why don't you pick a market that you started with and, and tell us a little bit about that? Why'd you pick it? Right. Cause you started in LA, can't do anything there. Let's talk about, um, Indianapolis or one of the markets you started in. Yeah, maybe um, we could talk about Kansas City, um, Let's do Missouri. That. Kansas yeah, City. so I have uh, five properties there. Um, yeah. And, you know, when I was kind of looking at uh, researching these markets, I kind of did a top down approach. So mm -hmm. I kind of used my auditor hat, right? When we look yeah. at financial statements, we do a top down approach. So sure. um, I looked at the big macroeconomics who are the big employees there? You know, what's the population? Is it growing? Um, what's the job market like? You know, what is the expected? Um, growth over the past uh, next five years. Um, also, you know, what are the big drivers? Is it, you know, a rental friendly market? Do they have good laws, things like that? So mm -hmm. I kind of researched all of that. And I think you can actually find that in a couple Midwest markets. So I looked at Kansas City. 
So I flew over there. Um, I've been there before when I was in high school, so I kind of knew the area, and my buddy lives there as well. Um, and I knew that the rent-to-price value ratios were uh, really um, attractive to me as well. So then uh, once I flew out there, I, um, it, within like four days, I think I set up like 15 meetings. Nice. So from you know beginning in the morning to night, I met up with turnkey providers, brokers, um, wholesalers, real estate agents, um, contractors, um, and other investors um, just to get a better feel for the market. And then uh, I would drive the streets, right? So after I did that and got my research down, um, I started turnkey. So I picked a provider um, that I thought had the right numbers um, and I invested with them. And then uh, naturally I felt like there was more scalability if I find my own team and do the rehabs and do the Burr method, right? Yep. Um, and that uh, first property, it's funny. Um, I had the exact same experience that you did uh, with Fresno because I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> it was painful, man. After after four months, I never saw a rent check again, and uh, you know, good dealing with evictions and things like that. But it was good um, because I think for me, if I would have bought one and stopped, yeah, um, then it may have been you know my wife telling me I told you so or yeah. me you know, being hard on myself and like, maybe this isn't for me, maybe go back to, you know, paper assets or whatever. But by the time I had one, um, and by the time the issues came up with that first one, I already had three under my belt. Ah. And the other two it was cash flowing nicely. It appraised above what I paid for. So nice. life was good. Nice. So I just saw it as a bump in the road. And Very cool. actually to this day, that's my only problem child that I have right now. And I'm looking to either prune it or fix it. So yeah, I think one tip that I would tell the newbies is that, you know, definitely do your homework with the markets and then, you know, find your own team and people that you trust because they're going to be your eyes and ears, especially me being 2000 miles away. Yeah, I think that's an important thing because I, I can't tell you how many times I talk to investors, right? It's definitely people like us in California, right? We're both in California. And we come in with our California brains, right? How's this have to cost over half a million and you know, all that nonsense. And then we hear about uh, Kansas City or Na Indianapolis or Little Rock or any Detroit or you know any of these other Midwest markets, Cleveland and um, forty grand, fifty grand. We're like, oh, cool. And then I talk to him about, okay, great. So you're going to do that, right? I've never done it. You know, good luck. And then I go, so when are you going there? And they look at me like, I'm not going there. Why would I want to go there? <laughs> I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Get on a freaking airplane or don't invest there, right? If why, how can you freaking put your money there if you're not going to invest? I mean, it's just crazy to me, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think because I also, one of the criteria was actually how many nonstop flights is there from ah, LAX? There you go. <laughs> just because I didn't want to take like a detour to Chicago and then go to that market. So That's nice. Yeah, because I knew I'd be probably going there at least twice a year. So yeah. Uh, that's, yeah that's, that I, right. Kudos for you. You're, you're doing it the right way. You're doing it slow with the process. Uh, near as I can tell, not doing anything stupid, right? Uh, which is which is kudos. It's easy to do something stupid when you're just starting. Um, so tell me about. Um, you said you had some private money, right? It, does this private money, you know, have a clock on it, or is it kind of family private money and you can pay it back whenever? Yeah, it does have a clock on it, and this was something that uh, my private investor and I agreed on. So this was. It, for me, it kind of everything happened uh, very naturally because sure. I wasn't necessarily looking for private money um, at the time. And this was on um, my fourth property. Uh, this was in Indianapolis. And I just had a good deal. I just knew this was a good deal because I drove that market and I compared it to other prices. And I was looking at the MLS every day. I had like four notifications. Nice. Um, so I've, I've been watching it like a hawk and this popped out and I was like, Hey, I told my broker, can you go view it today? Cause I know this is going to be taken away quickly. Um, and it turned out he actually knew the seller. So he looked at it the same day and then, uh, we put in an offer and we got it. Now I initially thought I can get 20% down uh, conventional financing on it, but the appraisal happened and they had some concerns, right? Sure. Um, they actually wanted like the roof replaced and this replaced. So I was like, at that point, then it's better for me to buy it all cash, rehab it. And I knew the ARV was going to be at least 40% more. Right. So I was going to burr this one. This was going to be my first burr. Yeah. Yeah. But the problem was I didn't have enough money to purchase and do the rehab. 
Right. Um, I had either 20% down or I had money to rehab it. So I, here I had this problem. I knew this was a good deal and I was just talking to my investor group. So I had like a Facebook uh, investor group that I created and I was just talking to investors from there and I was like, hey man, I have this great deal. I don't know what to do. What, what would you do? And he was like, hey, I actually have, you know, X amount of cash lying around. Um, I can lend it to you. So I was like, okay, let's talk about it. So then I started, you know, Googling, you know, what are some, you know, terms that make sense? Yeah. How should we write this up? And he and I, we already developed a bond over the past couple of months, just talking about real estate. There was no like pitching or anything. We were just, yeah. you know, sharing value. So that's why I think the conversation really went nicely. So the initial terms were at 10%. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, it was a six month, uh, payback window interest only, yeah. um, pay when, uh, the property closes. And I also had an option to extend it two months at a fee. Yeah. So that gave me a little bit of window cause he didn't necessarily need the money right away. Cool. Um, so yeah, I took his money and then I invested it and it was rehabbed in like a month because my broker also served as the general contractor. Oh wow. And he was, he just had a well-oiled machine. So everything went well. And then I actually ended up doing a delayed refinance. So, um, I just refied it out in two months, just capped at the purchase price. Sure. And then I paid back my uh, private investor. So awesome. yeah, that was, yeah, that was a good deal for me. Yeah. So just to, just in case anybody watching this doesn't know what Burr is, can you just sort of t just sort of outline the letters? Yeah. So it's buy, uh, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. There you go. That's right. Yeah. I, that's something I did uh, during the crash before it was officially called that. <laughs> it became <laughs> a thing after I was doing. I didn't even know I was doing Burr, but I did Burr over and over and over again because uh, it was a way to keep capital being recycled. It was uh, it was really valuable. So. Um, I think this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you jumping on uh, in a, you know, a couple hours notice. Uh, I, I think everybody's going to get, uh, get a lot of value out of this, Bo. I really appreciate everything you've done. Good luck. And as always, let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you.